This, this is a super, super duper tricky case. Um, this patient has history of, I think, colon cancer. Uh, you know, you can see the patient had partial hepatectomy, you know, he has a, a hepatic arterial infusion pump, and he's sent for uh, assessment because liver function tests are going up. And I'm gonna kind of go up and down. It's a very tricky case. And I'll, I'll, um, wait, show the infusion pump. I'm trying to trace it. The pump is okay. Why don't I okay. do it? Why don't I, uh, let's see. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, this is, uh, hold on. I just want to, so this is kind of hopefully we'll, there's a reason I'm showing you both kidney and the liver. All right, I'm gonna ask, what phase do you think we're in? Well, hepatic veins are lit, so venous. You mean the portal veins are? I mean the portal. Oh, just kidding. Yeah, that's the left one. Right. So, Artie, what do you, what do you think? <laughs> I'm not thinking anything. I mean, those hepatic veins are not yet opacified, but I don't, you know, I wouldn't say anything about them like they're thrombosed or anything. Right. Oh, wait, what was? So this is, this is, this is the, the tricky part, right? As you, as I scroll through the liver, this looks pretty classic late hepatic arterial phase, right? So the portal veins are pacified, hepatic veins are not yet opacified. Cool, it's just really beautiful late arterial phase. You can see that the liver, the spleen's actually kind of little heterogeneous too, so that kind of fits. But as you get to the kidneys, we are way- More like nephrographic phase. Yeah, we're in nephrographic. We have a couple of minutes into injection. So at this point, we should be way past the arterial phase. So, so are the hepatic, like the hepatic veins should be opacified. So they're thrombosed right. here. So this is, this is a few months ago. Um, now this is a little bit, you know, the later phase, but still you can see that the hepatic veins are truly nicely opacified. The day after patient had an MR. Now this was done as part of the, you know, uh, uh, met follow-up. So we did use EVIST. So this is the arterial phase, which is looks very nice, right? I mean, except for motion artifact, but you can see that the hepatic veins are not opacified. You know, spleen is very heterogeneous. And then when we get to, this is a 60 second delay. You can see that all the veins are not opacified. Wow, and in retrospect, that CT, I guess they did look more prominent, like bigger than on the prior CT where you could see the veins were smaller, but. Maybe, but I I don't I don't think I've ever seen such complete uniform thrombosis of hepatic veins, and it's tricky because we actually missed it on CT. It's very subtle. It's very subtle. Right? On CT it was just read as you know, and and honestly, I, I didn't read the CT, so I don't know if I would have. It's a good chance I would have just you know my eyes would have recognized it as late arterial phase and moved on and may not pay attention that the, the kidneys are like way past the, what we would expect in the arterial phase. What happened was the clinician uh, contacted the person who read the CT and said, you know, I am concerned this patient has really high LFTs. Do you see anything? And then the person kind of called me and said, you know, I think this is just arterial phase. What do you think? And I first, my first reaction was, yeah, I mean, that pretty much our two phase. But then I start looking, I'm like, boy, I don't think so. But I've never seen such complete, uniform, perfect 
thrombosis of entire artery, like portal. Like, and like the the thrombus that I've seen also, it's a little darker. Like it looks like a thrombus. You know, here it's very subtle. Oh, but that's why I said it's a very the, tricky case. Parenchymal, or maybe it's acute. Like I, I don't. Maybe it's. It's acute. a super tricky case, but it is. And if you look at MR, unfortunately, this you know once you you know these are the two the two phases that show this the best you can see the entire every little branch is out do you have the pre-t1 uh, i do hold on let me do this so that i don't have a second so it wasn't really helpful to be honest oh it's not moving no i know i, I I'm, I'm trying to get it oh gotcha gotcha okay um because uh, here I have a question. When you're showing the EOVIS face, is that the best face to look at it, or should we be just looking at like this? This is not EOVIS face. Place. This is 60 minutes. Oh, this, got it, this got, got, got it. Minutes okay. face. That's why this this is already five minutes, five minutes delays. And you can see here it's impossible to say because, you know, the the the, the, the liver is already picking up EOVIS so much. But if you pay attention really carefully, you notice that this signal is slightly higher than the signal in hepatic veins, but that's too subtle to do anything with. So that's what I'm saying that, that, that this, is, this is the key sequence, the portal venous phase when, when the, you can see that the, 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 vascular is, the vasculature is still slightly brighter than the parenchyma. So we should be nicely opacified here. Mm -hmm. And then um, I don't have a prior EVIS, but I have a old, uh, Arthi, you know how you've like talked about in the past when you start to see shunting, um, then you gotta check the va vasculature. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm just surprised we don't see much shunting or like changes. Like, yeah, it's so though, that despite was, like pretty significant burden. Yeah, or, the one I was talking about is like when you have portal venous thrombus, then you get the hepatic arterial buffer response where the hepatic artery takes over, but usually with, that's that's portal vein thrombus. Um, with hepatic veins, when they're acute like this, I mean, this is kind of in the spectrum of Bud Chiari, you might see like perfusion abnormalities in the caudate, you know, like other, you know, so for example, the caudate vein drains separately to the IVC. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you might see that one shunting differently, but yeah, here we don't really see any shunting. And then eventually you start seeing um, collateral vessels form and like spider web formation. But this, I think this is actually pretty acute at this point. Uh, possibly, possibly. But this is, this is, this, I, I don't know, this is a very subtle case. So, I, how did they treat it? Did they like anticoagulate? Did they go do a thrombectomy? I actually don't know. Okay. I think they'd probably start with anticoagulation, yeah, but it, I don't know. It looks pretty acute to me. Yeah. But pretty crazy case. Yeah. It's good that it hasn't gone into the IVC. The IVC looks. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. that's good. Cool. Okay. Ready? Okay. Liver lesion. What do you guys think? So here it is. Oof. Looks cystic. Cystic and also dark. Yeah. Um, maybe blood or something. Show you some. T1. So this is T1 pre. Okay. Arterial. Just ignore okay. the rest of the liver. So maybe there's a little bit of nodular enhancement, but most of it is non-enhancing. Venous, little nodule, delayed. Maybe like a complex. So some delayed. And there's a capsule. Enhancement yeah. and capsular enhancement. Well, can I see that show phase one more time, please? Mm -hmm. so I'd put mucin assisted, mucin assisted adeno, adenocarcinoma in there. Hold on, um, okay. This is the arterial phase. Let's go through the whole thing. Okay. Diffusion. Do you have diffusion? Mm hmm. So this, this is the, restrict. Yeah. This is the DW dark and then the ADC, which is it's kind of like shining through. So the dark is yeah. it's like dark through and T2 shine through. Yeah. So the cystic parts are shining through and the dark parts are darking through. We'll go back to the T2. off this sorry so this when you see like really bright and then really dark does that ring any bells 
Well, I thought it was like maybe old hemorrhage or old. Um... Yes. Can we see subtractions? Mm -hmm. I feel like I've seen this before and nothing comes up to mind. To <laughs> Once I tell you what it is, you're going to be like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, this is the traction. There's a little nodule of enhancement. Delayed There's one more phase. There's one more phase that you could ask me for. Wait, we saw arterial secret. portal. What do we see? We're so far so an arterial delay. We've seen arterial venous delay, T2, um, subtractions, diffusion. In and out? Mm, didn't help. Delay? Like, do you, do you have delayed, delayed? Uh, that's not the sequence I, that you, I want you to ask for. Okay, I'll just cut to the chase. Okay, so the additional sequence that we should look for is the old uh, exams. <laughs> That's and true. this was 10 years ago. So it was really T2 bright. And it looked like this. Nice. <laughs> so it was a giant hemangioma wow. that is now sclerosed. So this is what it looked like 10 years ago. So the best, you know, additional sequence is the old exam. So anyway, getting back to our current exam, obviously this is super tricky, diagnosis of exclusion if you don't have the old exam. Um, but some clues are that not many liver lesions will be this T2 dark. So that's the fibrosis or the sclerosed part of the hemangioma. And then these are the leftover kind of like, you know, blood spaces, like leftover hemangioma parts. Um, when these hemangiomas decide to fibrose or involute, they, they are called sclerosing when they're kind of involuting and then sclerosed when they're completely fibrotic. And this one is basically almost completely sclerosed. Although there was that little nodule of enhancement. Um, this is often like you have to like that little nodular area, but all the rest of this enhancement is basically the enhancement of the fibrosis. Um, often this, this will end up having to be biopsied. And it's difficult to get the diagnosis because you might just see fibrosis and blood vessels, but if they get enough big spaces um, or the prior exam obviously will be helpful. Um, and then a few other things about sclerosed hemangiomas. So um, as these hemangiomas involute, they become fibrotic, they can have calcification, they can have capsular retraction, they can have like geographic borders. Um, so those are just some of the signs. And then the big clue is like when you see something that looks really weird not typical for other things, but it has both bright spaces and then like really dark spaces. Very cool. Yeah, like the ones that I've seen are geographic and very, yeah, like subcapsular, but I guess because this thing is like low bar, it's, you know, it looks more mass-like. Yeah, yeah, no, super tricky. So anyway, that's it. So the next cases I'm gonna show you are kind of like, you know, courtesy of crazy memorial, basically. Not something you're gonna make, <laughs> not the diagnosis you're gonna make anywhere else. Or ever again, like I will never make this diagnosis preoperatively. But this was a, a patient who was referred to for, you know, for cystic lesion assessment and pancreas. And, you know, you can see that um, there's clearly lesion there, right? Um, you can see that Clearly, there is communication of the main pancreatic duct with this lesion, and you can see that the duct, both proximal and distal to the lesion, is kind of ectatic. You can see the lot of mix. Right. So that that was, you know, like my thought, and this is how I reported it. Hold on, I just want to get to the contrast. Sorry, since the PAX is slow off site. So bear with me. I'm about to get to the. So there was just these enhancing septations, which I'll show you in one second. There, okay. So you can see here that, that, that there were there were no nodules, but there were these enhancing septations, right? You can see that. And you know, so they they had the follow-up CT, which I will show you in one second. Just give me a second. And really wasn't, it was about a month later, pre-op. You can see kind of the same appearance. Uh, we don't see 
citations as nicely on CT as expected. Anyway, so this, you know, reported this originally as, you know, mixed up, mixed duct, IPMN and, and uh, CT kind of said the same thing. So because of the size and complexity, this was, you know, sent for surgery and pathology came back, ready? Colloid carcinoma with 80% mucinous component. And this is supposed to be a super, super rare cancer. Also. So that's actually like one of the cancers that arise in IPMNs. So why is this surprising? Surprising is I've never heard or seen it. And from when I start looking, it's actually the, the, the few case reports that I've, first of all, they're very rare. They're like less than 4% or something like that of, of all, uh, uh, you know, exocrine cancers. And um, the, the, the few case reports that I've seen, they're solid. And this one is 80% mucinous. Yeah. Um, so I have, uh, I actually have a really good companion case. I, I'll try to see if I can pull it up, but um, yeah, this is one of the subtypes of like, so IPMNs, there's four pathologic subtypes, like gastric, intestinal, um, pancreatico biliary and oncocytic. Uh -huh. And I think it's intestinal that turns into colloid, but it it is mucinous. It's mostly mucinous. So um, I have a really good companion case that looks like this, but, um, and they have like a much better survival than the pancreatic biliary type. They have like a 55% five-year survival. Oh, good. So this is a good one to know about. We actually had a case that was like, the case I want to, I'll, I'll try to find is we kept calling it like pancreatitis. It was like these fluid collections that were around the pancreas and, but then they were increasing over time. And so we're like, this is weird for like pancreatitis pseudocyst to be increasing over time. They went in and operatively there was just like mucin everywhere. And it was this exact thing. So it was colloid subtype of colloid carcinoma arising in an IPMN. Cool. Uh, I have another case pulled up. Should I? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Uh, but but just to just to like be clear, this is still like in the background of an IPMN. So I think yeah, like they, they, they were in the background of IPMN. Not... Yes. Yeah. It was okay. cor correct. Uh, okay, so let me close this one and open this one just in one second. So this one is also not like more interesting in terms of its diagnosis rather than its imaging appearance. Um, this is a, a 40 something year old man with a new mass in the liver. And, you know, the appearance, you know, T2 kind of slightly hyper intense, single mass. You can see sort of maybe target-like appearance on diffusion. Arterial phase is kind of all smooshy, who knows? Uh, portal venous. Victoria, any background liver disease? It looks a little lobulated. No, he had prior ablations. I'm withholding it. His Wait, history of HCC or no, like, no, what was ablation no, for? He's a 42 year old guy. He has a history, but not liver disease. This is a new lesion. So maybe MET? Right. So with this appearance, you'd think cholangio or a MET. And, you know, this was a biopsy. And this guy has a very interesting history. He's, I want to highlight that he's 42, and this, it's important to why I keep saying that he's 42. He has, this is a path-proven metastatic pancreatical blastoma in the 42-year-old. And how did he get uh, diagnosed with such, uh, sorry, he's not, he's in his 40s, not 42, but a little bit older than that. He had seminoma uh, about 20 years ago. And then he recurred about 10 years after the diagnosis and pathology of recurrence was, was more, was a teratoma then recurred and that teratoma did differentiate it into pancreatic blastoma. And now he has like, comes up with these nets here and there. So this was kind of a very unusual pathology in a very unusual story in this patient. So he started out with seminoma, then he's recurrent somehow ended up with teratoma, which then ended up going into pancreatic blastoma. Wow. So generally pancreatic 
blastoma is in children, right? That's the most common pancreatic cancer, um, malignancy in children. But it is interesting because I guess it makes sense. Like theoretically, um, any like teratoma has all three germ layers, so it can differentiate theoretically into like almost anything. Right. Well, it's crazy. Crazy, right? Can I go. Yeah. Oh. Uh, this is a patient with history of PSC, uh, routine screening. That's a gorgeous MRCP of PSC. Like you can, like you see all the structuring and you can see the mm -hmm. vessels going all the way to the periphery. Yep. Uh, so the, uh, this was called negative and patient got a transplant and his, yeah, like his common bile duct looks thick, right. in the center, but I don't know, is that just PSC or is it? Yeah. Looks thick right there. Yep. So this turned out to be clangio. Mm. If you go higher up, it gets even thicker right, right there. there. Yeah. yeah. That was all That's really through. tricky though, because a lot of PC patients, I feel like they have that kind of look, you know, and you know, what's interesting. I think probably the intrahepatic ducts didn't dilate because they're so structured, right? So you can easily miss that. Like there is that dominant thickening and stru structure centrally. I, I think PSC cases are hard, right? Cause that's yeah, what they're, they're looking yeah. for the yeah. dominant structure. What? They're very yeah. hard. Very hard, right? And I've seen cases just like this where we've called it concerning and they brush, 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 and they, the, there's no malignancy in the end. It's just the fibrosis and inflammation. So it's like, it's really tricky. I think it's very hard. They're, like, they're one of the hardest exams to read, I think. So Nelly, do you do you guys also get a lot of? I know that that uh, Minnesota has a lot, like a huge PSC situation. We get lots of PSCs for a transplant evaluation. Right. We we're we're the largest liver transplant program in the country. Apparently. Do you think, in retrospect, like you would? call something now or I don't I know I guess like what and that would trigger probably an ERCP with like yep. spyglass yep yep and I actually if it I don't like a PSC I feel like the bile duct should not be thickened and enhancing like this right I mean unless there's a clear explanation like cholangitis or something um so when I see it I call it I mean I read a follow-up post transplant that was like many years like six seven years later but uh this is this was a pre-transplant and they have no recurrence. No recurrence, yeah. That's good. I mean, let me tell you something. I, I have had cases with PSC where I saw I saw a mass, not even like this is this is very subtle, but I saw a mass, right? And I'm like, this looks like cholangia. This looks like cholangia. And they would go back and biopsy and biopsy and come back. Results are inconclusive, inconclusive. And then on transplant, it's cholangia. Even on biopsy, they're very hard, like, because it's like atypical cells. Is it, you know, is it that? So these are very tough cases all around. Hey, In this Nelly, case, this yes. Uh, Hi. Yeah. Hey, uh, on your case, um, yeah. the mass was that, uh, the one which was a soft tissue distal to to this, right? The thickening was it's just TBD. TBD. Yeah. yeah so, TBD. so scroll down. Uh, scroll down. Yeah. Right, right there. Is that the mass? That, that thing was a mass or? Uh, I thought this was the abnormality. Okay. Yeah, that is difficult. <laughs> um, I mean, thankfully, um, mm -hmm. the they do a complete like they remove the entire common bile duct and do a like a you know do a denostomy, complete do a denostomy. So it, it's all got it all gets resected in, um, for PSC patients in general. Uh, and I mean, that th this would still be an indication for transplant because it's still less than three centimeters and there's no extra hepatic disease. 
And they probably check, I mean, they do check the CN99. It can go up in PSC, but like, you know, if that's higher, then they get more suspicious. But I think it's really tricky. Okay. So patient had breast cancer, had a PET CT, and this was incidentally found. A hypodense lesion with a calcification anterior to the duodenum. Any thoughts at this time? I'll show you. There's, there's more. Like neuroendocrine lymph node met would be in my differential. I would just check the small bowel around it. Excellent. Excellent. So yeah, this is like in this para duodenal kind of near the groove. Um, always think about a neuroendocrine nodal metastasis of which the primary could be in the duodenum. Um, I'll just tell you it, and this was not FDG avid, but you know, neuroendocrine probably won't be FDG avid unless it's poorly differentiated. So, um, but, um, that's a great thought. That's not what it was, but we, I'll just march forward because we got some more imaging later on. So this is now a few years later and this is the lesion now. Oh boy. So it's bigger, still got that calc. So now, like the first time people didn't really see it, this time we saw it and then they got an MRI. Here it is on the MRI. Mm, um, so it has this kind of like interesting rim, dark rim. And whenever I see that kind of appearance, I think about like a hematoma, like some kind of hemorrhagic lesion. I will show you, this is the pre. The woman or a man? Um, it's a woman does it matter um, uh, it's, so it's this is the pancreas here so it's not mm -hmm. attached to the pancreas that's a, i don't know if that's what you're thinking but and it's touching the duodenum but you know not necessarily attached to the duodenum and it's pretty t1 bright so very you know has some hemorrhagic stuff this is their arterial phase mm -hmm. i'll give you a subtraction like a hematoma like ish thing yeah do you have so, angel um so, oh, so sorry, hold on. This is the subtraction on the arterial. This is the venous. This is the venous subtraction. So some rim enhancement, mostly non-enhancing. Uh, clotted out vascular. Exactly. So what okay. we thought was that this was a like a thrombose pseudoaneurysm or a hematoma or something like that. And I have seen these in this location where like the GDA, usually there's some little history of pancreatitis, but like maybe the GDA had some pseudoaneurysm or a spontaneous hematoma. Um, okay. So anyway, then it kept getting a little bit bigger. I'll tell you, it was not a pseudoaneurysm or a hematoma and it was not a neuroendocrine tumor. Any other thoughts? It was very bright on T1, right? Super bright on T1. So it did look like there was a lot of like, you know, blood. Okay. Duplication there. cyst. Great thought. But not that what it was. <laughs> <laughs> And I, these are all great thoughts. These are all the things that live in the do, uh, groove area. If we go back to that original one where we saw like the little guy, I don't know. It's not really, I'll just tell you, it wasn't eventually, it wasn't connected to the duodenum. Okay. Drum roll. This was a paraganglioma. Oh, wow. And with extensive cystic and hemorrhagic degeneration. So just a couple of things to remember that one, this is actually a good spot for paragangliomas. Um, all, and most of them, you know, in this spot might be solid, but um, they love to have cystic change. So a lot of like um, paragangliomas and pheos will have like cystic areas in it. Um, and then occasionally there'll be like ex the extensive cystic degeneration or hemorrhage. So um, this one tricked us. We were calling it a thrombose pseudoaneurysm that was growing. <laughs> which they can for, for years. And then finally they were like, okay, we're just going to take it out. And it turned out to be a paraganglioma. So just don't forget that they can also have. Wow. Chicken cystic degeneration. Yeah. And they love this location. So. This is another, the hell is happening case. This is a, a woman in her late thirties. She was referred for uh, assessment of pelvic mass, you can see here, very cystic. Um, you can see that has septations, right? You can actually see nicely that the ovary, uh, here's the right ovary, the left ovary is next to the mass, but 
we don't see really the claw sign um, on any sequence. And then here's the contrast, pre and post contrast. You can see some enhancing citations. Um, so here's coronal here. You can see on coronal again, very nice, well-defined cystic, close to left ovary, but doesn't look to be arising from it, inseparable from the uterus. And it doesn't look like a tube, right? Like on the coronal? No, no. it does no. not look like a, right. So this was read as, you know, probable uh, peritoneal inclusion cyst. Uh, you know, my friend showed it to me. I also couldn't really come up with anything better than that. Uh, although- one, one question, is there adenomyosis? What about mucinous cisadenoma? It didn't seem like it was coming from the ovary necessarily, but it's possible. Uh, Artie, you were saying? I was just asking if you, you would have called adenomyosis here. I don't see cystic spaces, but the junctional zone does look kind of thick. Yeah. It's just kind of like, oh, is there going to be an endometriosis spectrum here? But um... Well, funny thing you should say that. Um, anyway, so this this was called probably peritoneal inclusion cyst, although to be honest, even though I can't come up, I could, couldn't come up prospectively with a better thought, I didn't like the fact that it wasn't really encasing the ovary and it seems to have too much structure for that, but right. Anyway, so this was, sorry, did you show the T1 already? I, I, I missed it. T1, um, just nothing. ISO? Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. With like little septa enhancing septations. Gotcha. Diffusion, uh, diffusion was negative. Oh, no, this was outside studies, so no diffusion. Anyway, so the patient went to the OR because you know we really couldn't come up with a with a great story here, and this is so on operative report showed a normal appearing ovaries and fallopian tubes and anterior fundal pedunculated degenerative fibroid. It was removed, and the description is the lesion is composed of benign smooth muscle interspersed with variably cystic spaces lined by bland endometrial and tubal type epithelium. No significant cytologic atypia. The findings are most consistent with adenomyoma with extensive tubal metaplasia. I cannot figure out how this is an adenomyoma. <laughs> Wait, show the Zaj again? Is it like, so it's basically like it torsed off or something? I have no idea. Like I think I should better. stop attending these conferences. Like maybe the, the, the adenomyoma <laughs> gets in here. I don't know. So it doesn't even like, look like it's going through and through, though. No, like I know, it, I know. It, it looks like extra uterine. I know. So then I started looking. I thought maybe the key here is that it is, you know, uh, meta, this, this metaplasia or something. This is as far as I got. So th there's some 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 site. And, and then here it says that this, is, this should be endocervical. So the way they describe it here, it sounds like, it is, it fits that, that they're, uh, mo, you know, so that uh, usually is uh, somewhere here, it said that they're most commonly, even though they originate from cervix, they're actually most commonly associated with uterine body. Anyway, so I can't figure out how this works, to be honest, but that's the path. Wait, I do have something to say here, um, just yeah. about the idea of a adenoma hanging off the uterus. Yeah. I didn't really know that that was possible, but Susan Asher gave a lecture about adenomyosis that showed, and I'm going to pull up a, an image, but I will, I just want to say in retrospect, um, I had a case very similar to this where there was this weird cystic thing in the pelvis and it turned out to be an endometrioma. So I don't know. I just like, I think we should just okay, keep it. And, mind, I endometrioma, I would get, like I would buy, but adenomyoma? <laughs> yeah. I don't even know. <laughs> How do you even distinguish between those two when it's extra uterine but i guess they said it was attached to the uterus so on on during surgery they thought it was a pedunculated mass they saw a pedunculated uterine mass uh and they thought this was and they actually took it out as a, as a the uterus stayed based on certain based on the on the on the path it says that they took it out as pedunculated uterine mass and, and the cash bag excision resection. So they just took it out. 
based on pot on op report they described it as anterior fundal pedunculated degenerated fibroid so that... but the final path was adenomyoma adenomyoma yeah with, so with yeah. tubal with extensive tubal metaplasia okay but is this it... is the the picture that susan showed that i didn't really know about and i i'd have to like so anyway you can have like adenomyosis that's in the junctional zone and expanding the junctional zone. And then you can have like a focal adenomyoma. You can have an intraluminal one, but you can also have one. Yeah, that's that's basically what we're seeing there. Exactly. Yeah. So I didn't really wait, know wait, that. sorry. Yeah, you can have an extra uterine adenomyosis. Is yeah. that but is that endometrial implant? Like it's not the definition of I, no, they, I think they I still thought... call it an adenomyoma when it's like there's something about it that like it can hang so on. Did it go through or did it like come out like the we've retrofluxed into the I'm, I'll, I'll peritoneum? To... Adenomyosis. Oh. Um like with those, I thought they go through like the myometrium. Yeah, like I don't know what makes it adenomyoma versus endometriosis, but um, yeah, I don't know. We'd have to ask a pathologist. Am I crazy? Anyway, this could this concludes my my uh, case series of insane moral cases. <laughs> <laughs> Great cases. Yeah. So. Um... Patient came with uh, symptoms of UTI, and it's, that's that's not like a uh, eye test. You can see that there is significant thickening of the bladder. There's also um, there's like what are these things in the psoas muscles, and then also <laughs> like the, his sacral neural plexes look enlarged. Yes, like what are nerves. these? Was it like neurofibromatosis, dural ectasia? Yeah. That's that's a good thought. So neuro, neurofibromatosis. Uh, uh, any other uh, thoughts? So these are real things. These are like actually along the uh, plexus. Uh, pretty enlarged nerves. Patient also has similar thing in the cervical region also has got aneurysm and also has got pulmonary artery aneurysms and dilatation. Some kind of like connective tissue disorder. Right. So this, fans. yeah, so this is like, uh, yeah, I mean, this is like an incidental on a body case. So I just kind of wanted to show this. Uh, so this one, uh, the nerve, uh, thickening is is like this is a young patient uh, so this patient is like 37 years old uh, the nerve findings are uh, very characteristic of Charcot uh, Mary Tooth dis disease and they kind of have bi bilateral enlarged uh, nerves uh, is but that whole thing the nerve or is there like fluid yes. around the nerve no that this whole thing is a nerve oh wow yeah CMT uh, can can ca cause this kind of uh, uh, neuropathy and uh, also, uh, but uh, the unusual thing is this uh, vascular things which are associated with this. So uh, there are aneurysms. So uh, this is basically, we, we final diagnosis, we also don't know, but there is a kind of a uh, working diagnosis, which is, which I want to share that this is like, a, this is something which, which has been described where there's an earlier onset osteoarthritis, CMT like neuropathy, some autoimmune features, there are multiple uh, arterial aneurysms and dissections. So this is associated with mutations of the uh, SMAT3 gene. So this is this was like a very rare uh, uh, case. I think they, they mimic type 2 CMT uh, with uh, peripheral neuropathy. But uh, the feature which differentiates this vascular uh, entities like you have aneurysms and sometimes dissections and things like that. That aneurysm in the neck is really scary. It is. 
Yeah, they probably need to stent that. Yeah. So, yep. So I just wanted to show you this. This was like more incidental kind of thing. And then on further investigation, we kind of looked at all the imaging and then uh, with neuro, uh, kind of we, we sent it to the neuro. They also didn't know. Then finally, that was a working diagnosis uh, that it is a gene mutation. So the patient uh, will get some genetic uh, testing and studies and we'll see. I'll give a follow. Nice. All right. That's and way out there in the left field. The gene therapy. So, you know, there's the possibility that there could be some specific targeted therapy for it. Yep. 